Hello and welcome back to Inclusive Design 24 2018, which is brought to you in partnership with Barclays Access, the Pesciello Group, Intopia, Microsoft Edge and Open Access Technologies. Please do consider hitting the subscribe button on our YouTube channel to let us know you're out there and watching as our talks unfold today. And if you like any of the talks, this one included, please uh, hit that like button and uh, give the presenters a little bit of ID24 love. If you've got questions for any of our presenters, you can of course tweet them with the ID24 hashtag and we'll put the questions to the presenters at the end of each session. Adrian, do we have any uh, ID24U events taking place? We do, and when I learn how to operate a mute button, I will sound great. Rock and roll. Um, a big hello to all of our ID24U participants. We have a few from around the United States uh, who are actively listening now, or at least we hope. We have University of Massachusetts in Amherst, Massachusetts, the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, Michigan, the Nebraska Digital Accessibility Meetup in Lincoln, Nebraska, Northern Arizona University Disability Resources in Flagstaff, Arizona, and University of the Pacific Center for Teaching and Learning in Stockton, California. So thank you all for joining us. We appreciate you participating and we hope that you use the ID24 hashtag to ask questions and give us your feedback. And our next speaker coming up right now is Eric Bailey and he will be speaking about working with high contrast mode. And you're off, Eric. I mean, you're good to go. Great. Hi, everyone. Um, today, I'm going to be talking about uh, Windows high contrast mode, uh, how to work with it, what it is, uh, sort of the ins and outs. Um, before we begin, um, kind of a little bit about me. Um, I'm a designer at ThoughtBot in Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, if you are ever in the area, let me know. I'd love to grab a coffee and chat. Um, I'm an occasional author at CSS Tricks, as well as a contributor to the Mozilla Developer Network for uh, some accessibility-related concerns. Um, I'm also kind of a janitor at the A11Y project, which is an open source accessibility resource. All three of these things are really fun to contribute to. Uh, so if you ever feel the need to pitch in, we would love to hear from you in any one of these places. And uh, yeah, looking forward to um, seeing what you write. So um, before we begin, uh, due to the nature of high contrast mode and the way um, I will be demonstrating this content, there will be full screen, uh, full motion video very briefly. There will also be uh, high contrast ratings um, as well as some mild strobing. That's an effect caused when you shift the computer from high contrast mode to regular mode and back again. Um, if any of these are um, a trigger for a photo sensitive uh, condition, I would recommend uh, skipping this talk and uh, joining us at the five o'clock mark for Andy's talk. Um, that being said, they're pretty minor effects. Uh, so, Hopefully that won't be an issue. So to dive right in, um, so let's let's you know we have the ideal like let's imagine a pure perfect world of platonic academic purity and that's awesome and great. Um, you know designers and developers talk to each other, uh, have an open dialogue. Cats and dogs wear cute costumes and get along. Uh, compliance work for accessibility isn't an afterthought because it's baked into the beginning of every project. Just goes without saying. Everything is at least WCAG AA compliant, and Bob Ross is president, and it's lovely and wonderful and beautiful. Um, however, we don't live in a perfect world. Uh, things often get hurled over the walls from design to develop development, from uh, product to design, from product to uh, development. Uh, dogs and cats fight all the time, and um, project managers will cut support sprinting to get stuff out of the door. And this kind of creates what I like to call the um, gray eh, and gray ah phenomenon, where you have these values that are are aren't quite good enough to hack it in a design system. So like, it's either way too light to be legible, um, you know, like a one point one ratio, or almost even worse, uh, something so close but not close enough. So like a gray value with a ratio of two point eight. 
And that's, you know, one of those, it's close enough isn't good enough where it's not going to make you friends with a design team if you point out and say, well, you know, this, this is nice, but it's not good enough. But we are here to make accessible experiences, and this is a hard and fast value, and we're not here to placate people. Although ideally you can do both and you know talk to your design team. Um, the real world is complicated, and that might sound kind of glib, but there are countless factors to consider when doing compliance work. Um, and you know, frustratingly and interestingly, uh, sometimes what makes a good experience for one individual is actually bad for another. Um, take, for example, Ireland syndrome, which is a scotopic sensitivity. Um, it's a perceptual processing disorder, which is basically where light sensitivity affects the brain's ability to process information. Um, this is not as much a vision concern as it is a cognitive one, even though it does rely on a visual system to be triggered, uh, which is a really kind of interesting thing. Um, so a common trigger for it is, you know, 100% white text on a 100% uh, black background or vice versa. And you would think that would have the most contrasting ratio of all, so therefore it would be the best, but, um, this is actually may not be ideal for certain kinds of people where this, this value um, basically does trigger this sensitivity. I've also heard that um, these extreme contrast ratios can be a trigger for uh, ADHD as well as things like migraines. So um, it's one of those things you kind of want to keep in mind that like, uh, you know, while it is the most legible, it may actually be problematic for some. So you don't know what you don't know. Um, and because of this, you want to keep your content open and interoperable, um, by which I mean, we can make educated guesses about our audiences, but um, in creating these experiences, we don't want to inadvertently lock people out of the websites and web apps we create. Um, and we wanna give the end user the ability to self-select a solution that works best for them uh, if we do wind up in these scenarios. Um, people are handy. They, they will be a, all kinds of resourceful if you let them. Um, so here's a quote from Aaron Gustafson that I quite like. Um, and he says, it's important to recognize that experience is not a singular thing. Um, our experiences is not, our experience is not universal. Not everyone accesses content the same way we do on the same devices, on the same networks, in the same modalities we do. And when we design the web in the way that we experience it, we actually limit the way that other people experience it. We actually exclude the people that are not like us, and that's not great. So enter a thing called high contrast mode. It's a thing that exists. Um, it is a special mode that ties into the operating system, and it hooks into the way that uh, the operating system presents the elements that it uses to draw an interface. And it actually allows the user to manipulate this presentation in a very controlled way. Um, so where does it work? It works on Windows 7 and up, uh, not on Mac and not on Linux, uh, Windows only. So this means Windows 7 and Windows 10. And it works for Internet Explorer 10 and up, as well as Microsoft Edge. Uh, Microsoft Edge is Microsoft's new browser they built to replace Internet Explorer. It's actually quite lovely. Um, the development team is very passionate uh, and listening to the community and is introducing all sorts of great accessibility options. Uh, if you haven't spent any time with it, I recommend checking it out. And that all be, being said, um, even though my, Microsoft does not support IE anymore, it's still pretty prevalent out in the working world, um, especially kind of large corporations that provision IT. You'll probably find uh, disk images that their employees use with Internet Explorer 11, uh, kind of doled out by the thousands or tens of thousands. So IE still is a realistic concern in, in our world. Uh, high contrast mode comes with uh, four different themes kind of out of the box. We have um, high contrast one, high contrast two, high contrast black, and high contrast white. Um, each one of these four uh, themes has six properties. They're all common to each theme. There's text, hyperlinks, disabled text, selected text, button text, and background. 
and sort of following slides are how they look. So here we have high contrast one. You can see um, I have the ID24 schedule up as well as uh, a as a window in Windows uh, showing kind of the, the desktop as well as different kind of root folders for documents, downloads, pictures. And um, the image has been enhanced using these bright neon color values to really make the text pop out from the background and draw thick borders around kind of all the important interface bits. Next, we have high contrast two, which is a sort of subtle shift in the color. Uh, instead of yellow, we're using green for the text, a couple other minor tweaks. Um, then moving on to high contrast black, we can see that, um, you know, there's more black prevalent as the name speaks to. And then next we have high contrast white, um, where in favor of using black for the background of everything, it's white. I'm sorry about your eyeballs if you're watching this in a dark room. I know I just flickered from dark to, to light real quick. Um, so that's kind of, you know, a, a basic kind of demonstration of it. Uh, but if you're observant, you might have noticed that some of these combinations um, aren't WCAG AA compliant for color contrast, which is an interesting thing. Um, and because of this, uh, Windows actually allows you to create your own custom themes. So, you know, here I'm opening up settings and I'm going to ease of access, moving to the high contrast option in the menu, um, and then choosing high contrast one from the drop down and applying it. And it will take over the operating system. And you can see, again, kind of as a motion video of how that takes effect. And when you drag windows around, then we can click on text and it'll pop up in a color picker. So I'm changing the text to red, the background to blue, disabled text to gray, um, sorry, background to yellow, hyperlinks to blue, button text, I'm going to make, mm, I don't know, uh, red, and then the button background color white. And then, sure, let's apply it. So it'll let me prompt me to save this theme. I might need it. So I'm going to call it Hot Dog. Uh, it's a little tribute to Windows 95's Hot Dog theme, or Windows 3.1, I think. And this looks terrible. It's horrible and garish and yellow, and it looks like a McDonald's threw up. But the point here is that, um, we don't know this end user and we don't know kind of the environment that they're working in. So for them, the ability to select these colors to boost it to a degree where they're able to perceive the content on their computer is a very important and very vital thing. It's all about keeping that content open and interoperable. So who uses Windows con high contrast mode? Uh, spoilers, it's everyone. Um, people experiencing a biological condition, this can either be permanent or temporary. Uh, people experiencing an environmental condition, again, this can also be um, permanent or temporary. Um, you know, the, the, the go-to inclusive design example is uh, bright light and glare, um, you know, the noonday sun. But we also wanna consider an environment where there's low to no light on say a dark user interface and then it becomes really difficult to perceive stuff. Um, I was just reading the other day a story about kind of some complications of somebody working in a firefighting scenario where there's black billowing smoke um, and they were unable to perceive their screen. Not great. So you might be saying, okay, cool, this is great. Um, I'm really into what you're saying and I wanna plead a business case for it. So tell me the numbers of how many people actually use uh, Windows high contrast mode. Um, so I can take it to my boss and plead a case for it. And I say, nah, no. Um, here's a tweet from some random guy on Twitter. Um, I don't know him, I don't know his life. I did a little Google stalking after the fact just to kind of see what was going on. But he, it's uh, Sean Finglass and he's saying pro tip, max brightness and high contrast mode enabled allows you to use your laptop in the garden. Looks ugly but functional. Now, this individual is not self-disclosing any kind of disability condition. So I'm gonna kind of take him at his word and just say that he's some random dude who just figured out a way to make the technology work for him to operate a computer in an environment where he's comfortable. Um, you know, I don't know about you, but I think hanging out in a garden to work on stuff is sounds quite lovely. Um, you know, I live in the city, so we have some pretty nice gardens. It sounds great. And he's figured out a way that he can kind of work with the sun bearing down on him and still get things done. Uh, we also don't know what he's doing when he's 
using his laptop in the garden. And that's kind of an interesting and important thing. You know, he could be just answering email and surfing the web, you know, reading Facebook and looking at baby photos. Or he could be working on a thesis. He could be a law student. He could be, you know, answering case studies. He could be a lawyer. Um, and the thing is, is we're not making any value judgments on the thing that he's doing. What we're trying to do is enable him to be able to do those things. Um, that's a kind of a subtle but important point. So what I will say is uh, high contrast mode does feed into accessibility compliance uh, success criterion 148 specifically, visual presentation, um, where it's foreground and background colors can be selected by the user. Uh, traditionally, you will see this with browsers with the ability to override um, the, the website's style sheet that it downloads. So you can do this via, via browser extensions or via settings in the browser itself. But one thing I do kind of want to point out is Windows high contrast mode affects not only the browser, um, but it also affects the rest of the surrounding operating system. Uh, these browser extensions and settings can't do that. So that's pretty cool. Um, Firefox has partial support. Uh, I believe way back when, and this may not be true, it's just kind of based off of some research, they, they kind of got close to implementing it and then something happened and the support is kind of sort of there, but not really. Um, so it won't actually honor any code you write to affect it. Kind of more frustratingly, Chrome is aware of it and it will actually prompt you to um, it'll prompt you to go to their, their Chrome store to install a high contrast extension or a dark, dark theme. Um, but again, it doesn't honor high contrast mode code. Uh, it wants you to use its version of that. And it's important to note that these themes and extensions aren't interoperable and they do not affect the rest of the operating system. Um, I'd really like it if Chrome developers kind of you know, went the extra mile here and honored this code as opposed to trying to create their own solution, but that's a different story for a different day. Um, and here's how it works well, for browsers that do support it. Uh, and here's the secret. It's uh, semantic HTML. Um, let's have a little round of applause here for uh, semantics. Can't hear you because I'm streaming out, but I'm assuming there's a polite little applause. Um, native semantics of HTML elements allow them to be programmatically hooked into like operating system elements. Um, so by this, I mean we have hooks that the browser provides. And if we describe something semantically, say a footer, um, the operating system is able to understand, yes, this is a footer. Yes, this is a paragraph. And so for the web, we're going to want to take advantage of these hooks. And then um, like you do, control presentation with CSS. So high contrast mode gives us uh, three selector, uh, three media queries to work from. There's at media MS high contrast, white on black, at media MS high contrast, black on white, and at media MS high contrast, active. Of these three, you only want to use MS high contrast active. The reason for that being uh, white on black and black on white are too specific. And the kinds of code that I will teach you to author will wor that work for active will also work for white on black and black on white. Um, high contrast mode maps to CSS2 system colors, which is this basically an attempt uh, to, to describe every aspect of a user interface by assigning it a keyword. Um, this was a really noble endeavor um, and it's actually pretty cool, but there were a couple of problems behind the idea. Uh, first, it was Windows centric. And as we all know, uh, the world has grown to be far more than just Windows. Um, it's also, you know, we, we live in a world now where not everybody is on a desktop. Um, so mobile operating systems don't necessarily have the same kind of conventions that this does. Um, another kind of thing that was uh, unfortunate about these system color keywords is it allowed people who had uh, less than the best of intentions to spoof uh, what an operating system looks and behaves like. So here I've styled using Windows, um, using system color keywords, I've styled an old Windows prompt 
and it looks like a Microsoft critical critical update notification, and it's asking somebody to input their credit card number before uh, displaying a web page. And this is completely made up, but you can see how people may have used these hooks to take advantage of less technologically sophisticated people. So it's, again, another reason it was kind of cut. Um, but we're going to flash forward to 2009 when high contrast mode is kind of brought in to CSS. And it comes with its own high contrast mode keywords. So of those old CS CSS2 system color keywords, we have it pruned down to a limited set. Uh, if you remember the customization options from earlier, these keywords might look a little familiar. We have button face, window, highlight, highlight text, and window text. So kind of here's the breakdown of what these keywords hook into. Um, the, the, the A tag corresponds to a link. Uh, links are automatically mapped to A tags. Uh, this is even more ammo to use anchor tags for links and not spans or divs or buttons, heaven forbid, or any other kind of uh, unsemantic tag. Window text corresponds to the text you see on a screen. So the letters and words making up this table I'm showing you right now, um, anything you would write in an email, that's an example of that. Uh, highlight, uh, highlight text and highlight corresponds to the selected text foreground and background. Um, some people like to highlight as they read. Uh, so this kind of lets you make sure that this, this highlighting effect is actually able to be perceived when you drag your cursor across it. Uh, button face corresponds to button text. And window corresponds to the background color of the page. And you might be thinking here now, like, isn't this a little bit limited? And to you, I say, yes, that's the point. Um, Hugo Grendel, uh, a fantastic developer, said it best. Um, high contrast mode is not about design anymore, but strict usability. You should aim for highest readability, not color aesthetics. So by which I mean you want to kind of keep it predictable here. Um, it looks and behaves this way on purpose. We want gentle nudges and not complete overhauls for any high contrast work that we do. You don't want to completely redesign your, your site for this special mode. You only want to make sure that the content comes through as the user is using it to basically as a last ditch effort to understand, consume and understand your, your website's content. So uh, we're gonna take some common examples um, of what I've been talking about to demonstrate this kind of this light touch. Uh, this is when we're gonna start to get into some of the strobing effects as I shift between regular and high contrast mode. So uh, here we have an input, which is the work course of any modern web application. Forms are everywhere on the web, for better or for worse. And I'm going to toggle high contrast mode. I hope this works. All right, cool. So we can start to see that um, I am not likely to recommend <laughs> Microsoft Edge to a browser friend or colleague. I've already done that. Thank you, Windows. Um, you see that there's problems with this trendy, flat, and minimal UI element we have here. Uh, the, the background of the field has disappeared. Uh, the placeholder, uh, example, John, now looks like content just hanging out there. The label, it's just name. It's not really that evident that it's connected to anything, so it's just some words floating out in space. I'll go back. Um, so the first thing what we want to do is kind of address this pesky placeholder element. Uh, we're going to move it out of the form field. So when high contrast mode is toggled, it's not we're not confusing it for already entered content. For some people that are less technologically sophisticated, they might not understand that a placeholder is there as a guiding prompt. Uh, so here's kind of how that will look now. Okay, a little bit better. Uh, you'll also notice that the color of the, the placeholder has shifted to yellow and it's now text. Um, and then what we're gonna do is we're gonna start to throw in a uh, Windows Media high, high, you know, a Windows high contrast mode media query. And we're going to say, okay, when it's active, we're gonna take all the input tags and give them a border. Um, and the border is gonna be a two pixel solid white border. And if I toggle high contrast mode, 
you can see that it works. It honors the CSS. We now have an input field that looks like an input field and not just an empty space. Trouble with this is the color de declaration is absolute, and uh, Windows high contrast themes are dynamic. So a white border won't be visible on a black text on white background mode. Uh, same for any other color that we pick, as you can pick any other color for any other value. There's the chance that it'll be it'll just sort of disappear. Uh, the same applies for kind of any other work we'd be doing. But what we can do is swap out that color declaration with a keyword instead. Uh, button face will dynamically update with a theme. So here, I'm going to toggle it again. And you can see uh, it's still white, but it's only white because white has been assigned to button face um, in the current high contrast mode I'm using. You can see that also some of the, uh, the UI Chrome is using that same color as well. OK, cool. So next, we're going to talk about uh, ARIA and buttons. So um, ARIA is handy for wrangling content not described with native semantics. So for whatever reason, you have a span tag that's working as a button, um, and you can't use the button element. And you know, modern frameworks seem to have this real big love affair with ARIA. So you probably are run into this situation a lot. Here we have a button to download pizza. One day this will this will be real, and I can't wait. Um, so again, what we want to do is target high contrast mode, uh, because if we pop in right now, we see that our button just looks like static text. It doesn't read as a button. It's just the word download pizza. And you know, aside from the verb that tells me to download, I don't really know what's going on. So um, here we want to target in CSS the attribute selector that targets the role of button. And then we want to manipulate the border and the color to make something that visually reads as a button in high contrast mode. Um, I personally find that rounding the corners of your button help uh, because it communicates visually that it's buttony compared to the sharp kind of rectangle that we seem to be getting with um, with uh, inputs these days with flat flat web design. Um, and then you also want to be careful for buttons that have uh, gradients to communicate their buttonness because gradients are technically background images from the perspective of CSS and Edge has opinions on that and may discard it. More on that in a little bit. And we can see with this CSS working here, cool, our button now reads as a button regardless of the mode that we are looking at it in. Uh, so content considerations. Um, you know, we, we've kind of done uh, inputs and some static text and some buttons. Uh, and there's some other things that high contrast mode has some opinions on. I'm going to walk through them now. Uh, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, background images um, you know, what you want to do is ultimately don't use CSS background images to deliver content. That's a quote by Terrell Thompson. I agree completely. Uh, background images can't be read by assistive technology. Um, they don't have any alternate descriptions unless you do some clever ARIA. Um, and, you know, it's interesting that uh, Edge actually has, the latest version of Edge has an opinion about this. And what it'll actually do is draw a background if it can if it thinks that text is put onto a background image and there may be trouble identifying that text over the image it'll actually draw a background for you without asking you and i know this isn't very visually pleasing but again we need to remember that it's legible and i don't know about you but i'd rather have something ugly and usable over something pretty but illegible any day of the week uh, so raster images are images described with pixels uh, jpegs pngs uh, GIFs, et cetera. They're static, which means the browser does not know what they contain. So it's important first to, ass to assign them alternate descriptions. Um, one of the things we can kind of do is uh, high contrast mode is a media query just like any other media query in that you can use any CSS property you want. Um, and I come from a background of print design, uh, newspaper print design, and an old newspaper trick that you can do is boost your brightness and saturation and contrast a little bit. Uh, the idea here being that we know that it's going to go onto some grubby newspaper. So we actually want to do little tweaks to work with the medium that we have. And you want to use this with discretion. So like apply it with care and consideration to like hero images and big, you know, big fancy 
take attention things, but don't try to do it for everything. Uh, it's a small surgical tweak again, remember. And you know, much like photography, if you can fix it in the camera, it saves you a lot of work. So get that contrast there. Here I have a photo of Joe Biden, the vice former vice president meeting Joe Biden, the the puppy. Uh, this is a real thing that happened and it's delightful. You can see when I take this into high contrast mode, um, it's boosting these images a little bit. And this is kind of an over-exaggeration. Hopefully the your, your browser screen's quality is good enough that you can kind of see this transition going on. But it kind of shows us all the little tweaks and tricks that we have available to work with. Um, SVGs are images that are described using markup. And uh, computers can read markup, uh, which is a very cool thing. So there's three main treatments to consider for high contrast mode for SVG content. Um, so the first variable in CSS is current color, and that is whatever the text color is. And the beauty of the cascade is that it will honor it regardless of the mode that you're in. So here I have a single inline SVG um, with a single color with a fill of current color, and it's white matching the white of the text. But if I shift into high contrast mode, um, I don't even have to write a media query. It just says, oh, the text is yellow now and updates to match. And that saves us a lot of work, which is really fun. Um, for more complicated interactive icons, what we can do is um, swipe out the background as high contrast mode may eliminate it and then adjust the border color and the fill. Uh, so here I have some like, you know, windows, Microsoft Office style small buttons. And if I toggle high contrast mode, it removes the background, but it has them reading as uh, buttons, again, with that affordance for rounded corners and the outline, um, matching kind of all of the things we do for buttony things. Um, for complicated graphics and charts, one thing that's kind of weird here is if we shift into high contrast mode, we can actually um, target different parts of the of the bar chart or the other kind of you know graphic that you have to dynamically update uh, to match. <clears throat> sorry, excuse me, to match uh, the other high contrast mode values that we're 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 doing. And again, this is working with a within a, th a theme, so you don't run the risk of say having a blue background and a blue bar chart. Um, data point that suddenly is rendered invisible. Another thing that we want to do um, is use texture, so we're not relying on color alone for these graphs. Um, I'm using a stripe effect and a solid fill, so they're more distinct. Uh, all right, sorry, I just kind of got ahead of myself here. Um, and the third is a complicated SVG illustration. Um, believe it or not, this is the sports car here is actually written all in SVG, meaning it's built out of markup. And for complicated graphics like this, uh, you just want to preserve it as it is. Um, there's no way you can kind of dismantle something like this and build it back up using high contrast mode values. So toggling it, just let it ride um, and hope that the graphic is authored with you know, enough intent and has an alternate description. So you don't have to hope that a person has perfect and optimal viewing conditions. Um, for media, say audio and video, um, the best advice here is just to let it be. Um, and just make sure you do all the things you normally do to make this kind of content accessible. Uh, you know, for example, uh, it's really cool, uh, as VTT captions, which is what you'll be doing for video, are uh, interoperable, they will update dynamically in high contrast media mode, high contrast mode without you having to do anything to affect the media. Um, cool. So you know we we have now kind of an understanding of high contrast mode and how to kind of work with it and the ins and outs of what it's good for and what it's not good for and the kinds of content um, that it can affect um, and plays well with. And now we're going to get into some of the fancy tricks we can do with it. Um, and I want to say just as a blanket kind of caveat, use this again with care and discretion. We are making small tweaks, not complete redesigns. 
Um, we can have a utility class that will remove something from high contrast mode, but maintain layout. Uh, and that's just visibility hidden inside of a high contrast mode media query. And this is like a last ditch thing. If there's something that is just the algorithm that determines what is and what isn't content is promoting something um, and it's just not supposed to be part of that experience. It's decorative. This will just, this will get rid of it. No questions asked. Use it again with a healthy amount of um, discretion. And you might want to take this opportunity to figure out why it isn't described semantically and fix it that way instead. Uh, we can also kind of do the inverse where we force something to display as text. Um, all the things I just said doubly apply so here. If you have something that is um, important content and it is not authored in a semantic and interoperable way, you kind of want to go back to the source and figure out why it is that way and not <laughs> the right way. Um, Joe Watkins has a tweet um, where he's reveals that adding a transparent border to buttons that have no borders can help make the buttons more obvious in high contrast mode. So basically a declaration of one pixel solid transparent in kind of regular non high contrast mode, um, you won't see a transparent border as it is transparent, but the way high, tra high, the way high contrast mode works is it'll toggle on when you flip it. Uh, and you want to be careful with this. This isn't a blanket solution to all your high contrast woes. Um, it's kind of a nifty trick that uh, that gets you thinking about the way uh, the browser approaches CSS. But border is a calculated uh, size. It does affect the size of the element it is applied to, regardless of if the border color is transparent or not. And then the other thing is one pixel may not be sufficient um, for low vision users who are also using high contrast mode in, in that it is hairline thin. Um, and because of that, that it's hairline thin, especially if they are zooming, it may not be immediately apparent that this border is associated with an element or they're evil, able to perceive it at all. Another interesting thing we can do, kind of speaking back to the the inter Internet Explorer land, uh, is we can throw it into a match media query in JavaScript. So if there is the presence of support for MS High Contrast Active, we are more or less guaranteed as as guaranteed as you can get with browser sniffing for support for Internet Explorer ten. Uh, that also lets us write a conditional, so we have a good fallback experience. Uh, we want to be crafting good, uh, progressively enhanced experiences for all of our users, and Andy will speak to that shortly. Um, and then now we're going to kind of get into related media queries. And these are uh, from the level sp five spec. Well, they do not specifically speak to high contrast mode. They do kind of live in the same world. And I want to make sure that they get a little attention because I'm pretty excited for them. Uh, we have the inverted media query, which detects the presence of an inverted screen. So say we're on the web, we're looking at Facebook, and we invert our screen to kind of see if we can read things better. We notice that um, all of our images are also inverted, and it turns a nice photo of two women into kind of this terrifying ghost nightmare world. So what we can do is invert the inverted images using CSS with a filter. Um, now, when this mode is toggled, our inverted images are then inverted back, um, and we have a nice photo again of some, some women in New York, and that's great. Uh, another thing we can do is detect the ambient light level um, of the device. So this is kind of cool because we're now just making the assumption that most devices have some sort of camera cap capability and can detect the outside world with it. So what we can do is boost contrast in high, um, in bright environments. Uh, so like if the light is washed, we sort of bring the, the background color and boost that up and then kind of increase the font size and the color to just make it a little bit easier to read stuff despite the glare. Uh, the other kind of cool thing here is because CSS and HTML and JavaScript are interoperable, we can, you know, hypothetically create specialized browsing modes just, you know, by rolling up our sleeves and doing a little programming. Uh, this is not a real extension. I've just kind of comped it up, but it's potentially a extension that just will toggle washed mode for any site that supports it. Uh, and that lets the user kind of decide that they want to see um, a kind of a 
high contrasty experience on their own terms. And I think that's pretty neat. So how to do it? How do we how do we implement high contrast mode? Um, well, you test. Uh, you test, you test, you test, you test. Uh, since this is a dark corner of development, you want to catch gaps and idiosyncrasies. And the best way to do that is to try it yourself. Um, there are tools to test out there on Windows for free, so just add this as one extra step to your normal access, to your normal quality assurance and or accessibility process. And if you're not already testing for accessibility, there's no time like the present to get started. Um, and where do you do it? So you want to do it early in your process. Um, you also want to do it late in your process, by which I mean um, here we have the kind of the shift left model where idea and product, and the more uh, you go more right towards a resolved product, the more time and cost it takes. So what you want to do is get these, these considerations in early on while you're still developing your style guides and kind of the little bits and bobs that make up an interface. And then you want to test it after the fact to make sure it's actually working the way you intended. Uh, no, no plan survives contact with the enemy, so you want to make sure that everything is that you have carefully constructed works in context. Uh, but you're saying now, OK, I have a Mac because I'm a developer. I don't have a Windows computer. And I say to you, uh, we can get a Windows computer for free. Uh, Microsoft provides virtual machines for Internet Explorer 8 all the way up to Edge. That also gives you the Windows operating environment to work on. That'll run on your Mac. It simulates a computer within a computer, which is very cool. And then uh, Amazon Workspaces also offers a service where you can remote into a virtual machine. That's uh, kind of like watching Netflix, only instead of watching Netflix, you're just messing around on Windows. That's really cool if you're on a low-powered machine that can't handle the strain of running a virtual machine locally. Uh, this one is for pay, but it's relatively inexpensive. Um, I think I've paid $20 in the last four months for Windows computer use, which is relatively inexpensive compared to an accessibility lawsuit. Uh, and so finally, kind of in closing, I do want to leave you with this one thought uh, for high contrast mode and also just kind of web design and development. Um, good user experiences meet the user where they are and not where they hope, not where we hope they'll be. So uh, thank you. Um, I just want to say thank you to ID24 for this opportunity. Um, and if you have any questions or comments, uh, these slides are will be online on GitHub, um, as well as Noticed, which is a great presentation hosting website. Feel free to reach out. Uh, here's my email or social media, and I'd be more than happy to answer any high contrast mode questions you have. Thank you so much, Eric. That was absolutely jam-packed, full of useful information on an area of accessibility that I, for one, always think I should know more about, and I think I've gone away today <laughs> feeling like I do know a little bit more, that's for sure. It was wonderful, actually, to hear you mention SVG in there. Um, I didn't know about the the current color capability. That yeah. Um, I, I love SVG because it's, it's performant with ARIA. It's got the capability to be screen reader accessible, and you've just, you know, uh, given me some more insight into ways it's it's even better than that. Yeah, it's it's great for um, Retina as well because mm -hmm. you know it's it's resolution independent. So we're gonna get you know some some Mac device that'll have like a quintuple Retina display, and you know, right? Uh, SVG yep. has it handled. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep, keeping the visual quality for sure. Uh, Adrian, did we have some questions coming in? There, there, there was a question about using a transparent border, but then Eric went and handled that. Um, <laughs> And by the way, that that's a great tip about being careful when you use it. So thank you for that, Eric, and thank you for including that. Um, another question: There are there are some libraries and um, um, resets out there for setting styles, you know, generically in a project. Mm -hmm. Is there a generic set of styles or some sort of library or component framework that? Uh, default style sheet, et cetera, that already includes some of these fundamentals for Windows high contrast mode, such as borders for uh, form controls and, and colors and things like that? Yeah. Um, so a lot of what I showed you is actually ways to dodge around um, when the framework or the CSS that you've authored actually overwrites what Windows high contrast mode does. Um, so if you're using good semantic HTML, so in the, the 
input element um, for your form fields as opposed to a span with the ARIA roles applied to it. Uh, the, the way the high contrast mode algorithm works is it will read the page and it'll say, ah, input, I must draw a border around that and use whatever color value that has been supplied. So in an, in an ideal situation, you don't actually have to do that much work save for toggling it before you deploy your site to see if it actually holds up the way you thought it would. Um, this is more so you have a lot of ARIA and a lot of non-semantically described content. And it's a way to kind of ensure that it's still operable uh, in this in this specialized browsing mode. It, it sounds to me almost like uh, some of the best advice for supporting Windows high contrast mode would be to use native and semantic HTML elements. That's that's a that's a interesting and intriguing <laughs> idea, Adrian. <laughs> I wish somebody had thought of that before. And now <laughs> Slides dedicated to it, but I'm just reaffirming your assertion. Yeah, An uh, another kind of interesting, as long as we're on the topic of special browsing modes, um, there is a great article out there that I will tweet out that's just kind of occurring to me, uh, where uh, another developer researched uh, reading modes. So iOS is reading mode. I believe Firefox and a couple other browsers have them. And the same kind of semantic markup that you'd be using to describe your content that makes it work in high contrast mode also provides the hooks for for the reading mode. So if you kind of just want to toggle a pure reading experience, um, that's a great way to ensure that your content will actually show up. I have, I have another question that's coming from the Twitters. Um, some designs in full color space have primary and secondary button styles. Example, example a primary button is blue background, secondary button has gray background. Can you suggest how to convey primary versus secondary button in Windows high contrast mode? Um, so first you wanna make sure you're not relying kind of on, con on color alone ideally to communicate priority. Um, so I think in those kinds of situations, you know, you might have kind of a, a save cancel, like that kind of input where there's a primary action and a secondary action. You can mess with a uh, border thickness. Um, but like, I think it's just sort of, it's more a case of being descriptive with what your buttons actually do. So save, you know, save what? Save document, cancel, cancel what? Uh, that kind of thing. Um, it's an interesting thing. Yeah, I, I might also noodle a lot more about that or follow up on Twitter. Hi. Well, um... Eric, I appreciate the talk, and I appreciate the time that you took putting it together. Yeah, thank you very much. This was this was a lot of fun. And um, <laughs> Lena, you want to wrap up? I can certainly do that. Uh, for everyone listening in, uh, if you liked Eric's talk, and I'm sure you did, please uh, consider hitting the like button on the YouTube channel. Um, and while you're there, perhaps you'll hit the subscribe button. We're trying to make it to 600 subscribers to the channel before we're done today. And uh, I think the uh, the target is in sight, so help us do that. A reminder that uh, Inclusive Design 24 is brought to you in partnership with Barclays Access, the Paciello Group, Intopia, Microsoft Edge, and Open Access Technologies. And with thanks to our supporters, DQ Systems. We'll be back with you on the hour. And this time we'll be with Andy Bell, who is going to be talking about an area that's not only important to accessibility and inclusive design, but also to web development in general, that of progressive enhancement. So don't go away. We'll be back with you soon. Cheers.